Greetings and welcome to the Elephant in the Room. My name is Joe Kobothi. Today I'll be speaking to Kwame Owino. Uh, Mr. Owino is a, is a current executive director at the Institute for Economic Affairs. Uh, welcome Kwame to the Elephant in the Room. Thank you very much. So, so to just uh, start this conversation, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago now uh, to the date, uh, uh, Kenyans woke up to, to to, to a fuel shortage and Kenyans were queuing in petrol stations, petrol stations uh, because of uh, the claim then there was panic buying and the shortage of fuel in the country. Uh, thereafter, a couple of things happened. One, uh, uh, the the P the P the PS for for, for the PS said in in, a, in an interview I think two weeks ago on on NTV that uh, the reason for the fuel shortage was because uh, Kenyans are panic buying and is a, is, a, is a cause of fuel shortage. Uh, and thereafter, there was a, there was a slight, uh, I think the issue was resolved a bit. Uh, we saw the president uh, signing a supplementary budget uh, by giving the, the, the oil marketers uh, money so that fuel can be subsidized and that can continue. And then this week again happened and then Kenyans are back at uh, long queues, you know, people, people spending uh, long nights uh, fueling, uh, at, at gas stations looking for fuel. And then today, uh, CS, 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 Monica Juma uh, told us that uh, it's because there's this, there, are, there are oil marketers who are, who, are, who are committing economic sabotage. And so, I mean, Kwame, I mean, Kenyans are really confused what's really happening, like what's the cause of the fuel shortage? And there are very many narratives. So if you could, I mean, just give Kenyans just a, a glimpse of what, how did we get here and what's really happening? All right, so let's start with the fact that yeah, it's true that this uh, uh, what we call the shortage is not is not just something that started this week, mm -hmm. um, but the, the the approximate causes, which are the immediate causes, mm -hmm. and then there are also other structural causes. So let me start with the structural cause. The structural cause is this: oil or petroleum, crude petroleum, is a global product for which demand and supply happens within global markets. So it's high, it has a global purpose. Right. Kenya is an importer of that crude petroleum. Mm -hmm. So part of the fact is that the prices of petroleum will reflect what those changes are globally, whether it's the demand supply, whether it's the effects of COVID, or whether it's the geopolitical, which people call, I mean, out of that conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, mm -hmm. Russia produces something like 10, 15%, I mean, 10, 12%, of daily oil output. So because of the, the sanctions that are going in, that affects those structural things. And those mm -hmm. structural things are basically how oil is taken, produced, refined, and then what quantity is demanded by specific countries. So the global quantity demand and the fact that Kenya has, uh, has um, uh, imports it means that there's a part of the petroleum prices and its supply in Kenya that are determined externally, not by Kenyan policy. Right. So that's the structural cost. The, the structure. Now, so what affects the structural costs? So obviously, I've spoken about the effect of the of the conflict. So when you come to Kenya, the Kenya shilling has also been depreciating over the last, I would say, six seven months, quite a bit, because this is a product that is bought externally. That price effect, right? becomes approximate cost because it's obviously leading to the rise of the, 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 the rise of the prices in terms of how much you pay in Kenya shillings to get a liter of oil or a, or a barrel of oil. Mm. So those structural costs the government of Kenya has no control over, or at least cannot control as much for being a small country that just absorbs, I think less than 1% of all global oil demand. So that's it, that's, that's, that's the thing. So first of all, it's, it's outside. Then the politics of external factors and all those other things all mean that regardless of what we do in Kenya, the prices of oil will, uh, I mean, the, the global prices will affect how, how it is available uh, domestically. So let's come to the proximate and the causes in the country. Now, this is a product that is export, imported. In the year 2013, because of a clamor by Kenyans that uh, global oil companies were, were colluding, parliament passed a law and some regulations making the Energy Petroleum and Regulatory Authority to manage the price of oil or petroleum sold in the country on a month by month basis. So you know that petroleum is important, mm -hmm. regardless of how much costs are paid, 
the Energy Regulatory and Petro Petroleum and Regulatory Authority calculates what the margins are for the suppliers, for the retail, for the wholesale, and what the average cost has been, the refinery, the transportation, and decides the price available in every town all over the country. Right. So that means that there's a global product whose prices we cannot control, but internally we are trying to control prices in order to make it affordable for, quote unquote, to make it affordable or stable prices for, for the Bonanji, uh, mm. for the city. Then about a year back, uh, the, 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 Parliament passed mm. through a proposal from the, from the, from the Ministry of Energy, mm. a law which lifted the price of, rather the levy on petroleum, it's called petroleum development levy, which used to be used for oil prospecting. It used to be 40 cents per liter of petroleum. It was raised to five shillings and 40 cents, and it was renamed as the price stabilization fund. Right. The argument is when prices rise globally, government will collect this money this out of this fund and then use that fund to support the stability of prices over time so that we don't have sharp changes. So remember, globally there are things we can't change, but internally we have taxes on the, on the part of that oil and we also have all these levies we, which determine how much we come. Mm. The, the levy was established, a fund was established even though there was no legal backing for it. But it was, it was determined that we need to control because of the significance of petroleum in Kenya. I mean, if you bring it, it's in transport, it's used in manufacturing, it affects food production. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very basically available in every sector. It also mm -hmm. affects energy production, I mean, um, electricity generation. Mm -hmm. So because of that, government has an interest or claims to have an interest in making that price as low as is possible or a stable price. So the stabilization fund was supposed to be that. So some money was collected and placed in the stabilization fund. You and I know, a report from the Auditor General says that this money was diverted. So there was no mm. money within the stabilization fund. Mm. When oil prices started to rise globally, at the same time as global oil prices were rising globally, at the same time as the Kenya shilling was depreciating, it means that the price of oil in, I mean, the pump price in Kenya had to rise for both for kerosene, premium, and diesel. Mm. The stabilization fund did not have money. So what government told the oil marketing firms, corporations, is you pay, right, mm. for delivery, but we will compensate you from the fund. Mm. This has been delayed for almost two and a half, some people say three months. Mm -hmm. What that does is that except for the farms that have a lot of money, which are the bigger farms that are able to borrow and all that, right, to, to mm. fund their operations, it means that every time they are selling a, 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 a liter of petroleum, so today, based on what global prices are and what the formula suggests, premium petrol, which is uh, what others call super, right? Is mm. selling in Nairobi, for instance, at 136 shillings per liter. If you benchmark it globally and you calculate, it should be at least 20 shillings more expensive. Mm. So that 20 shillings, it means for every one liter of petroleum that is sold, government is subsidizing. Of course, they claim it's the claim is that it's the stabilization fund. The stabilization fund has no money because it's been depleted and some of that money was actually diverted. Then because of that delay, many oil marketing firms had a legitimate reason. So they were not onward selling and they were not taking supplies because they didn't have the money to pay for it in advance and all that stuff. Mm. So the signal that the price signal was, look, we can't continue to sell under the prices you're telling us to sell because they can't sell above a certain price because if they did, they'd be violating the law. So that's it, that's the point. Now, a law was passed in parliament to the supplementary budget for 33 billion. Mm. Our calculation at the Institute of Economic Affairs is given oil demand a month, and you are subsidizing 20 shillings for premium in Nairobi, and 26 shillings for diesel, right? Mm. You need to spend between 10 to 14 billion shillings per month mm. in order to keep the the oil marketing companies reimbursed. So that reimbursement problem is part of the reason some of them do not have money and they couldn't. Mm. So you have controlled the price <laughs> and then you're not giving these people the real price. So basically what it means is that the laws of economy, so I'm going back to the structural causes, mm. the laws of a market problem is telling us that guys, you have not set this market right 
and therefore the incentive for anybody to continue to sell a product on which they're losing 26 shillings, they're paying up from 26 shillings per liter, right. and they have to wait for three months to be reimbursed, mm. just break the incentive to supply the product. Mm. So that's basically the problem. So the approximate costs are the changes that Kenya makes that change, affect the prices of all. The structural costs are the structural costs that come from the fact that oil is an internationally traded product. Mm. So, so then Kwame, uh, uh, when within this context, uh, to, to what, to what part of the, the shortage that we're seeing now is one a policy failure, as we're actually talking about, you know, uh, you know, abracadabra policy making, no, and, and 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 tied to that, at what tied to that, uh, what part of also this crisis is also sheer incompetence and corruption? Because you have talked about it's a supplementary budget that, uh, I mean, the legislation passed the money, and we saw last week the president. Signing, signing a supplementary budget of that two billion, and yet we are still in a sh shortage. So, uh, at what, this, there, there are three things outside of this, the structural issues that we need to talk about. One is a, there's a policy failure, and then two, there's also a point of we're talking about corruption. But also, at that to that, at what point of this also is the Jubilee's administration failure of money of debt and just uh, managing the economy? But how are these three factors uh, tied towards the current fuel shortage? Okay, so to, to tie back the question of government public finance, because if you establish a fund, which went back to parliament and then parliament provided the regulations for that collection, because hitherto the fund was established without reference to parliament, which was a violation of constitutional requirements. Mm -hmm. And then it was fixed after the fact. But what was happening is that this money was being collected, mm -hmm. right? but it was not saved. Because if you have a fund, you're supposed to have a fund available as a reserve. The reserve was not kept. Mm. Because the reserve was not kept, the, the, the ministry that was responsible for, for, for this project, I mean, for the stabilization fund, did not have money to actually give the dealers. So the mm. dealers were pre-financing mm. in addition to paying their own costs. After some time, they don't have an incentive to do that. Now, it's true that the president signed a, um, a bill last week uh, under supplementary bill of 33 billion right mm. which is supposed to pass. remember they already owed two months two and a half some people say three months so the 33 billion was already only paying them for the last three months mm. which means they were starting on a new slate in which they are getting for i mean they're acquiring further debt so that money ran out or was running out pretty quickly mm. there's been a claim that of that 30 billion already 11 billion has been released but that's just equivalent to one one month mm. so it means that if two months were due as some are suggesting and some for much longer then obviously there was two months worth of uh, income. I mean, of, 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 of income that was due to mm. these farms and that was working. So that's, that's, the, that's the thing that's happened. So when you have a price control, mm. and you're asking people that we are going to save money and use the reserve, and the reserve is not available. This is where the diversion came from. It means that the reserve was collected, but that money was diverted. And mm. it's true, because the Auditor General's reports show that some of that money was actually diverted and used to pay for the standard behavior obligation. Precisely, yes. So here is where um, that violation has come from. Mm. Now, I will not necessarily call it corruption in the sense of theft, but I'll call it policy corruption in the sense that you collect money and you prepare a reserve and you ask parliament to authorize taxation for the one purpose, and then you divert it entirely for another purpose. So to that extent, yes, it's a violation of strict policy guidelines and therefore policy corruption. So mm. you're right. And so as we conclude, I think it's telling us that the government is failing to be to level with Kenyans and tell Kenyans, look, this is a product that's imported globally. I mean, that's competed for globally. We cannot assure you of artificial prices. Why? Because the government of Kenya itself has huge debt obligations and has very little reserves to keep for any other purpose. Mm -hmm. So if money becomes available, it's usually used for something else. So we are not surprised, in my view, even if it's obviously a strict violation of law, we are not surprised that a fund existed only in name, but mm. there's no reserve in it. So that's a, that's, that's a point. So there are a series of violations. Some of them, if you're trying to, to knock off how markets work, you need a lot of money, and sooner than later, you run out of money. So the price control mechanism, which is completely wrong policy, has collided with bad luck, which is global affairs that we do not have control of, and it's demonstrating a little bit of incompetence. And what government needs to say and warn all of us, I think the cabinet secretary for finance did that last week, 
is that it is not possible for the government of Kenya to afford giving people who drive cars an additional 14 billion shillings for free. Mm. Need to let prices reflect what they are because neighbor, neighborhoods are. Let me add one point before I come back to you. One of the things that's been done is I see reports in the press saying that government was saying that oil marketers are trying to untwist government and create economic savage. Savage, yes. rather. Yeah, yes. By taking products in hand here and actually continuing to provide products for their open markets, I mean, for their markets across the region, mm. but not supply the country. And that's clear. Uganda, Rwanda, Congo have not controlled the prices of petroleum. Mm. Therefore, the prices that reflect there are prices that reflect what is real. So if a marketer takes their petroleum to that part of the world, it will be bought and they'll receive their money for the right amount. They will not be subsidizing anybody's purchase of petroleum and then ask for a government. That is economic law at work. Mm. People, and when a product is the same product, it has a substitute, it will go to the people who are prepared to pay the price that is actually most consistent with what its value is. Mm. Uh, artificially here, you have prices of 126 per, 136 per liter, but you do not have it. So yes, it is only available by name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, this, this, this economic uh, fuel shortage, in, in, a, in a sense, it's almost like a, it represents a, like a kind of economic policy that Kenya has really, really, really uh, guided itself very top down, very controlled by the state. But also, as people have been talking the uh, last couple of years, cr a chronic capitalistic state where uh, the state and or individuals in the state use the levers of the state to to to, to control the economy. So it's not a, it's not really a free market economy, because and and this now ties to my question, which now comes next. This is affect is going to affect our politics, not just twenty twenty two elections, uh, but moving forward. And 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 a concern has been having because in nineteen ninety two we liberalized our 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 politics. We introduced multi party. In 2010, we democratized the state. But, but the key concern that Kenyans have been having, and, and I think one faction of the of the political divide currently has really uh, picked that angst and zeitgeist, you know, with bottom-up economics and you know, and the other side has responded with you know Pesa and Foucault and 6000 ETC. But a, a crux of the concern people are having is that they they that too this our economy is, is too opaque. And people are even saying, who are these oil marketers? You know, then I said people are saying, uh, we also have a shortage of milk, and people are saying, why are we having uh, monopolies in our industry? So moving forward, even as we talk about the fuel shortage, as, as, a, as a really, really, really as a glance to how our economy is run, how do we start having the conversation around democratizing our economy, such that we are always not running to government for, you know, price controls, price controls, what's happening, you know, there's a, you know, there's PR stint every other week, but really just saying, okay, how do we now allow the, the levels of the market to just to just control this thing? And uh, for particular areas where we feel, maybe for public goods, where we feel the government should invest in health education, we allow them to, but they allow other spaces of them, a decentralized kind of economy. How do we start having that conversation? Close to 60 to 70% of the milk that is produced in Kenya is actually consumed at home without mm. the pasteurization and the big companies. Mm. So the part that is probably we speak about when we speak monopolies is actually the pasteurized or packet milk. And that, yes, it's true. Um, there's one big farm. Uh, whether it's politically connected, it's a different matter. But for an economist or a student of economics, we know that monopolies and dominance are dangerous. Hmm. In the it's a position for somebody to actually dominate. And actually, instead of being a price taker, they actually become, become a price maker. And mm. So that's, uh, yes. But the history of Kenya shows, the history of Kenya shows that they, every year between uh, December, and sometimes I mean January to March before the long rains come because of the dry season, late season, especially if the short rains do not come, we usually, Kenya usually experiences a decline in milk production in mm. the areas that produce most of the milk. So part of that is a, a reflection of um, Kenya's ecological or uh, um, weather conditions. Um, so that if there's no, is insufficient rain, obviously there'll be no grass and the manner in which Kenya's 
cattle are bred um, shows that with a reduction in grass, a reduction in feeding quality, obviously the production of milk does happen. So usually it resolves itself very quickly by the time we get to April when the rains come and by May, people mm. forget that it happened. So it has a circular effect. Mm. I suspect that is what is happening today as well. Now, mm. monopolies can make a position like that worse, which is mm. what brings me to why Kenyans need to actually support the fact that government has certain things that it does well. Running markets is not something that needs to be mm. isn't. Um, So one of the things you do is we need to have a little more faith in private sector people and in people who come in with um, people who come in with uh, or rather with competition. So that if one person is trying to exploit farmers, another person will actually compete with him. Competition is a healthy thing, regardless mm. of whether the competing person is a Kenyan citizen or a person who is a citizen for the purposes of conducting business in Kenya. So we really need faith to be built in, uh, in real private sector and private sector uh, performance. Because most Kenyans are private sector people. The smallest farmers in Kenya working in his own peasant farm, I mean, as a peasant in his own farm, producing his own potatoes, producing his own avocados, or producing his own mangoes, or maize, as the case may be, mm. is actually a private sector farm. So we mm. think of private sector farms are not necessarily the biggest telecoms companies or the biggest banks. That's not true. There's a spectrum of them, and most Kenyans are actually there. So we need more respect. And for government to stop using words such as cartels mm. to justify interventions and setting prices about how you and I can exchange goods that we want. So mm. moral markets, the moral force of markets come from the fact that you give people choice. And giving people choice means that if one person is trying to exploit another by raising the prices beyond what people can afford, people will have the choice to seek an alternative. Mm. And in seeking that alternative, it actually creates, it moderates the greed that some people have in the market. That's the truth. So what would Kenyans need to do? Our thinking at the Institute of Economic Affairs is the government of Kenya has no business being in markets. That's one. I mean, running businesses. But the second, the government of Kenya needs a privatization program, but also to innovate competition policy and law, which is to systematically break down or systematically go out there, implementing rules that ensure that competition and consumer rights are protected. Competition is the biggest threat to every consumer, whether it's banks, if you remember, um, I mean, many younger Kenyans don't remember that 20 years ago, if you wanted to open an account, banks would ask you for mm. yes. Mm. For people, sometimes they'd ask for your payslip to be able to tell that if you're receiving some amount below a threshold, then they wouldn't want to hold your account mm. because they prefer people among others. And all that has changed, partly mm. because there's been more competition in Kenya's banking sector. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect, but there's been more competition. So competition is a consumer's and the citizen's best friend. Mm. Parliament needs to do its job as well to actually expand that. Mm. Um, even within the petroleum sector, I just learned a couple of days back that 40% of retail uh, petroleum is actually sold by small, medium, small, small petroleum dealers who either have one small uh, station or even just have one pump and they're mm. delivering closer to, to villages and all that. So the disruption of their market mechanism and the disruption of their price mechanism through a price control, which was supposed to help the market, I mean, was supposed to help the consumer, is working against the consumer today. Mm. So let's just get government out of business and say, in the same way that we can manage different flavors of people running political parties of one kind, from independence to the big parties that have been with us here for close to 50 years, 60 years, is the same way we need to allow for all kinds of businesses to thrive in the sectors, be they agriculture, be they petroleum, be they banking services, be they telecommunication. Mm. Finally, finally, Kwame, I mean, the fuel shortage uh, certainly is going to affect, uh, you know, electoral politics in the next 115 days. And I mean, choices have been made and, and political players of both divides are using this crisis to, you know, to, to sway, to sway in votes. However, the next regime coming in, uh, unlike, unlike what happened, unlike 2013, where uh, coming taking from Kibaki, there was, there was fairly there was macroeconomic stability. Uh, the economy was 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 growing steadily. Uh, from just uh, an economic standpoint, we can talk about the social cohesion, but there was there was, there was a fairly sense of economic growth uh, during the, the 2013 regime transition to now. 
and and since our politics is is evolving slowly, but there's still a sense of feudal capitalism that many players within the political space uh, have have, and we are around dynastic politics and all that, and ethnic warlords. But this kind that kind of politics isn't useful for a free market economy because I mean you need to you need you need to to to, to sustain ethnic patronage. You have to intentionally control parts of the economy to for patronage systems. So then how 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 then move again post August twenty twenty two? One, what should Kenyans do to really be to really advocate and really question the kind of political economy moving forward? But then also even as as people like you, uh, people who are involved in think tanking business, how what kind of policy recommendations do we now need for the incoming government? And saying, listen, you actually, you you're adopting a, a failed a, a failed economic model. You know, this is not 2013 where things were dandy and you know there was a sense of things are moving. You actually, whoever comes in, uh, we we are steep in debt, steep in an economic crisis. IMF are here. How do we move? How do we start moving uh, post August 2022? Okay, unlike many people who think that we can only reset, it's clear there's, there needs to be an economic reset. Unlike many people who think that the only reset can only come with the same the last administration, I still think that President, President Uhuru, who hasn't done well at all in the, in the economy, um, can still do something which gives him a legacy, for I hear all politicians look for a legacy. <laughs> and one of them is to accept right away that the price control mechanism for petroleum prices in Kenya is failing mm. because many Kenyans in the border countries, I mean, the border cities are actually driving across to buy petroleum from other parts of the, of, of the neighborhood. Why? Because while petroleum is, um, is more expensive right there, it's available. So an admission that controlling prices or trying to control prices, which by the way, came up before President, President Uhuru was, 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 was uh, admitted, I mean, was, uh, was, was elected, um, is something that he can admit that, look, the times tell us that we have to be real, and he can do that before he leaves, because there are many things. He, President Uhuru has um, still about five months, because even if you have an election on the 9th of August, August. I think it will, take, it will take another three or four weeks before the, the mm. new president actually assumes office. So in total, he has five months, in which he can still make things better. Um, or at least without the burden of the elections can actually make the kind of good economic policy which might not necessarily be populist or more, most popular, but is essential. And by that, bequeath to whoever comes out after him a far better economy or at least a foundation on which a good, uh, a softer landing, let me say, than what whoever comes after him will do. That's, that's right. necessary. That's, would be a sign of good faith, but also would show that uh, we learn from the errors and some of the strong. But if we continue as it is, there'd hardly be an economy because food prices are rising, inflation is going up, food prices are rising. The Kenya shilling is going to continue to depreciate in our view. Uh, there's nobody who knows how quickly the conflict, the invasion of Ukraine will be resolved. Mm. All of us want it to be resolved now, but we don't know for how long. If those things all go on, it's going to become tighter and tighter. And all these policy strictures that we have, price controls and, 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 and all that, are just going to make President Uhuru's uh, performance look worse and worse and generate more crisis that would make the, the, the elections itself more fraught with, uh, with tension than could be. Mm. Finally, Kobe, this is my last question, away from the fear shortage, but, but linked to it. Uh, particularly around policy making in this country, uh, the, the, the economist Paul Krugman talks about cockroach ideas. And it, it particularly for people in the media like myself and you in think tanking, that there are very many cockroach ideas that become uh, popular. And then when there's actually policy action around those ideas, Kenyans come back and now complain. Uh, uh, for instance, as an as well of example, uh, for a long time, Kenyans would say, you know, there's a lot of traffic on the road. We need to get the trucks out of the road. Uh, I mean, I mean, of, and then, what we had there is now, you know, I don't know how SGR came, but it was part of that, the trajectory of that, you know, idea reform SGR, and then now we start complaining how it's a white elephant project. How how do we start shifting the public sphere to so that so that we don't? I don't think it's a Kenyan problem. I think I think that there's something wrong with our public sphere generally. How do we start so that so that 
our policy making, even, even post August 2022, one is not populist, but then two is grounded on sound, sound economic research public policy. How, what's, what's the missing up and then how do we move into that space? Uh, Joe, it's not an easy thing to solve, but I think mm. it's one of the things that the elephant can actually do a lot by making sure that when I, I for instance, fear on this, on the, on the part of economics, I fear the ideas that are most popular because they are comfortable and they usually represent a leap in imagination. Mm. So for instance, you mentioned the SGR. You're right, the SGR was extremely popular. And I remember, I mean, I, I usually don't receive a lot of abuse and I'm a free, 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 free trader. I mean, a free speech person. But some of the abuse that I, I mean, I, I, I laughed at or sometimes concerned me on the internet was with regard to calling out the fact that, look, the, the economics of the standard gauge railway was completely bad. And two, that you cannot believe that anybody thinks that providing a laptop to a standard one, a class one child who's sitting on the floor is going to make him a professional. Those things were popular. Hmm. It remained popular in some people's eyes. Um, but Kenya stand back and the same people who are uh, supporting them are today not supporting them because it's easy to smear President Uhuru. And even people who are saying, such as the deputy president, for instance, mm. who said in 2018 that the that the standard gauge railway would, would break even within six months of the date he was speaking. Mm. Uh, today talking about white elephants and stuff like that. So yes, we make it easy for people to speak from both sides of their mouth. So calling out people in real time is one of the things that the media ought to do. So that's the first. The second is just you and I to continue to, to call out these fallacies. Um, the IEA has a book called 52 Economic Fallacies which we hope to publish by in, in March, I mean, sorry, May, in a month and a half. And part of that is actually just to expand the education of people. And the assumption is it should not be that uh, less educated people actually are more prone to fall um, victim to, to, to economics fallacy. Actually, I call them the Porsche and the Syrians, who are Kenyans mm. who think themselves serious because they have a successful career in a bank or have a successful career in an engineering firm, assuming that therefore economics is easy because in his view, uh, he understands calculus and therefore understands how an economy works. Um, that's not true. I think economics is just as complex as any profession you're required to read very, very well. And what you as people in the media should avoid, should try and make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, of course, your media think tank, which is the, ele the elephant, is actually to ask Kenyans to avoid expertise inflation. Expertise inflation is where somebody thinks that if you're a good an ac accountant, you therefore become a good economist. That's not true, right? So encourage people to actually be more humble about this, the statements they make because they've been successful as lawyers, making them good policy experts necessarily in the area of economics. So part of that is, it's a continuing thing of policy education, encouraging debate, which Kenyans don't like because they think debate is an angry thing or questioning a president that we, we dislike. But we have to encourage debate and encourage people to actually find accessible forms of information in areas in which they're not necessarily trained or in which they don't have as much knowledge. That is what Paul Krugman says, and I think he's correct. Thank you so much, Kwame, for your time here at The Elephant. Thank you. For this and other Elephant conversations, follow The Elephant on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at The Elephant. Uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe to The Elephant, also on our YouTube channel by clicking on the link below.